Hi, I'm Namrita Ramachandran and I graduated from the National Law School of India University in 2013. Presently, I work as the Consumer Law Fellow at Akosha in Delhi. Today, I'll be taking you through the module on Constitutional Design and Federalism. The module is divided into five subparts and we shall begin with the chapter on meaning, theories and types of federalism. Before proceeding further, it is important to understand the meaning of federalism. Simply put, it can be recognized as a system of divided sovereignty. Though the basic premise of federalism rests upon a division of powers at two or even multiple levels, there is no single form that it can assume. Every federal structure has its own distinguishing features but is also similar to the others as an attempt is made in every case to carefully preserve the federal government's authority as well as the regional governments. Federalism can be defined as the existence of multiple levels of government within a single polity. Each of the constituent units is assured a certain level of internal autonomy over a defined jurisdiction, usually through constitutional mandate. Although traditional federal structures are connected to a constitutional design, this is not a prerequisite for a federal system. For instance, in France, the top-down devolution of authority is only distantly connected to the constitution, whereas in China, it is the result of a legislation which could just as easily be reversed. Federal arrangements have also seen to exist through organic and basic laws, custom, tradition and treaties. Distribution of powers in a federal system is another question altogether. Which powers belong at what level might seem like an obvious choice, but is actually a complex question and depends upon several factors like constitutional requirements, economic and social needs, and logistical efficiency. Fiscal federalism is an example of this issue, as are environment and waste management policies. Federal systems further follow vertical arrangements and horizontal ones. In the former, jurisdictional and territorial hierarchies are established between the federal union and the state governments, where the union, in some cases, may possess greater powers than them. In the horizontal structure, the union and the constituent units enjoy a similar structure of legislative, executive and judicial powers. At this level, interaction and coordination between the states are sought to be achieved by equal or equitable representation of powers. Federal governments not only strive to divide powers across multiple levels of government, but also to empower them and ensure that one does not encroach upon the other. Now we move on to the theories of federalism. Literature and debate relating to federalism have given rise to three theories. We begin with the classical theory. Proponents of this theory include Dicey, Ware and Robert Guerin. According to Ware, federalism is a system of government where power was divided between the general and regional governments, each of which was independent of and coordinate to the other. However, the simplistic elements involved in this theory have now become somewhat obsolete, especially in the wake of wars and economic depression. The term independent was also heavily criticized as it is believed that the central and regional governments cannot exist in isolation from each other and there is some degree of mutual dependence involved. More neutral terms like autonomy are better preferred by modern theorists. Now we move to the origin theory. As the name suggests, this theory seeks to explain federalism on the basis of the circumstances that warrant its creation and is further divided into the sociological, multiple factor and political theories. The sociological theory states that it is the federal nature of society that gives rise to a federal political system. This theory accounts for diversity in society, diversity based on economic conditions, race, religion, historical background and so on. This theory has also been criticized for merely discussing the question of diversity but not providing an answer as to why diverse units would desire unification. The multiple factor theory takes into account the necessary and sufficient conditions required to form a federal structure. While explaining the reasons 
for the formation of a federation, this theory also points out, and importantly, that a desire for unification should also be followed by a desire for regional units to retain their own autonomy. According to the political theory, the formation of a federal structure is essentially a political affair. It states that political motives play an important role in the origin of federal structures and that federalism is the outcome of a political bargain and is best suited to describe federal structures which were formed out of aggregation or disaggregation of nations. It successfully explains the origins of older federations like the United States and Switzerland and even new ones like India and Malaysia. The functional theory supplements the origin theory and explains how and why a federal structure prevails under changing circumstances. It has also given rise to the concept of dual federalism. The next subpart we move on to are the reasons for unification and division of powers within a polity. In some cases, it has been suggested that federalism is one way of solving the problem of expanding societies without resorting to coercion, aggression or imperialism. The motivation behind smaller units to form a federal structure include a desire to unite as such for myriad possible reasons ranging from security and administrative ease to unification for cultural and linguistic similarities. Federations can come together in two ways. The first is to become part of an existing unified polity by means of a bargain. The second is for entities previously having distinct jurisdictional identities to come together. The primary reason separate units came together seems to be for defense and security, both foreign as well as internal. In fact, a classic confederation was earlier defined as a unity capable of waging war. Other reasons include economic benefits, trade, commerce and welfare concerns. Though it has been widely suggested that federalism is neither an economic nor sociological concern but a political affair, in several cases socio-economic factors actually take precedence over political reasons. In other cases, obviously, the converse might be true. What is common, however, is the process involved in the formation of a federal system, an arrangement that ultimately forms a union and a federal union at that. The sentiment behind the formation of a federation is of a group of people consenting to common rule without actually giving up the desire to rule themselves. Scholars have used the concept of bargain to describe federal arrangements. They have further described it as a constitutional bargain, a system within which daily politics can take place. Federalism is a tool that aids in governance at the same time possessing the ability to limit the authority of governments. Ideally, this arrangement should be flexible enough to enable efficient governance but not so unstable that the original allotment of power and authority can shift easily in favor of either the center or the state governments. It is for this reason that a strong and rigid constitution protected by an independent judiciary is considered to be a prerequisite of a federal system. Defining federalism has been an academic battle with attempts being made to include as many aspects of the system as possible. It started with expanding Ware's interpretation of the American model, often considered to be the epitome of modern federalism. What followed were scholarly debates with inputs from Livingston, Friedrich and Elazar and an extended understanding of federalism from the original American model to include other arrangements like condominiums, leagues and associated statehoods to name a few. However, Riker's contribution can be said to be the most lasting one. His simple test laid down three prerequisites for a system to be called federal. Two levels of government governing the same citizenry and land, each level possessing a distinct domain where it could exercise autonomy and some form of guarantee of this autonomy. Riker's theory, though helpful in a general understanding of the concept, does not account for every type of federal state. This is probably why a broader definition 
that encompasses the possibility of different manners of distribution of powers came into use. According to this definition, federalism is the coexistence within a compound polity of levels of government, each with constitutionally grounded claims to some degree of organizational autonomy and jurisdictional authority. Now, we shall take a look at the different types of federal arrangements that have been created over the ages. Confederation. A confederation can be said to be the earliest form of federalism. In this system, the constituent units that form the union would hold majority of the powers, and the units would maintain collective control over the common union. A distinguishing feature of a confederacy is that the delegates of the constituent units form the common union, as opposed to their citizens directly electing the members of the common union. Next is the federation. It is from here that the idea of federalism is derived and finds its origins in the United States following the American War of Independence, where the founding fathers envisioned a political system in which smaller units of a government would govern themselves and at the same time follow one constitutional governance of the general government. This central government, so to speak, would have precedence in matters where it was granted the authority for the same and would also have the authority over every citizen of the constituent units. In a typical federation, the autonomy of regional governments that make up the union is usually assured by a constitution which cannot be unilaterally altered by the central government. Even so, this cannot set to be a prerequisite of a federal government. There are also contesting claims that describe federations as a species of federative systems, where a federation refers to a coordinate and not a subordinate relationship between the centre and the states. The next type is asymmetrical federalism. In this arrangement, although the smaller units enjoy a considerable amount of autonomy, the larger constitutional and sovereign powers vest in the common union. Another type of asymmetrical federalism includes a system where even the smaller units do not enjoy equality among them and are represented differentially. Such asymmetry is of two types, de facto and de jure. The former is related to differences in the subunits based on territorial area, culture and other such factors. The latter results from a deliberate constitutional aim. The idea can also be explained by Riker's theory according to which federalism is the product of a rational bargain. Constituent states not possessing the same bargaining power would account for their inequitable statuses. Further, variation in interests was also a way to discourage secessionist tendencies. For example, in India, states are not equally represented in the Union Parliament in terms of the number of representatives per state. Similar reasons justify fiscal incongruities as well. Even the special status accorded to the state of Jammu and Kashmir is a good example of this kind of asymmetry. Now we move on to the subpart on international law and unification. Even international law has said to have had an impact on the formation of the federal structures of nations. The concept of subsidiarity is used in these cases according to which a central authority should have a supporting role instead of a subordinate role and should perform only those functions which might be difficult to carry out at a more immediate or local level. This concept is used to describe the relationship and the organizational structure in supranational bodies like the European Union or the United Nations. As ambiguous as the term is, it plays an important role in this debate as it is the most common explanation offered to suitably justify the authority of European institutions vis-à-vis -vis the sovereignty of the member states. With respect to the European Union, subsidiarity is normally understood as a political or legal principle that regulates the relationship between the larger community and the member states it comprises. However, mandatory compliance with supranational legal instruments such as in the case of the EU, also promotes a type of unification among the member states, loosely mirroring a federal system. Even this unification is at two levels. First, it unifies the legal regimes within the European Union, and secondly, it unifies the law within the member states, 
As often, the supranational laws are directly applicable to and possess overriding powers over the laws of the smaller units. A similar outcome, though on a smaller scale, is affected by the ECHR on the Council of Europe as well. Unification on a federal model or otherwise is also possible when states participate in international projects like the UNITRA, UNCITRAL or the OECD. But practically speaking, unification through compliance with international law is a rare practice. Next, we come to the subpart on citizenship and federalism. The question of citizenship is not a common topic of discussion when it comes to federalism studies. Dual citizenship, as understood in terms of a federal structure, where an individual is both the citizen of the common union as well as the regional governments, is conceptually and legally different from the concept of dual citizenship under international law. It also presupposes that the Federation confers upon individuals citizen status with respect to the Union as well as the constituent states. In a federal system, not only would citizenship depend upon the relationship between the Union and the states, but also between the different states. The question of citizenship in this context can be dealt with by using a twofold approach. By examining, first, how a Federation as a whole deals with aliens and secondly, how the different states treat citizens of other states. In the first instance, the treatment meted out to non-citizens is more or less the same. Politically and legally, a citizen's rights and treatment expected from the government, and more often than not, are clearly stated and codified. However, when it comes to citizens of states, some constitutional like the American, Australian and German ones prohibit discrimination whereas others, like the Canadian one, may permit some forms of bias. Another important area of concern to be discussed here is that of immigration, whether it should be dealt with by the Union as a larger question of security or by the states into which immigration actually takes place based on more economic and administrative interests. The final part of this presentation deals with case studies of three federal structures, the United States, Germany and India. The Founding Fathers described the American Constitution as in strictness neither a national nor a federal constitution but a composition of both. At the time the term federal was understood to mean what we perceive of confederal today, a union that is a confederation of sovereign states. In the early days American federalism concerned itself with limiting the authority of the central government and giving as much power as was administratively possible to the constituent states. It was only later that these powers of the states were transferred to the center. What distinguished American federalism from the others was that it was conceived as an end and not a means to an end. It is based on this that other distribution of powers took place. American federalism modeled itself around three essential conditions supremacy of the constitution, distribution of the government's powers among different bodies thereof, and the authority of the judiciary to interpret the constitution. Strangely enough, modified versions of these conditions are found in other federal systems, including India. American federalism from conception has allowed the states to take the forefront in certain matters, and the judiciary thus seeks to restrict the union powers if found to transgress into the realm of the states. Recently, in Prince versus United States and New York versus United States, the Supreme Court of the US held that the federal government could directly control private parties or ask for help from the states to this end or even bargain with the states for help, but that it normally may not appropriate the state's powers. This is also evident from United States versus Lopez, where the Supreme Court overturned a law because it believed that Congress had overstepped its powers to control interstate commerce. A similar approach was taken in United States versus Morrison, where the, where the judiciary restated its authority to regulate the seemingly unfettered powers of the Congress and protect the federal structure envisioned in the Constitution, even in the domain of common law crimes. Though not every constitutional challenge to a federal statute has been favorably entertained by the judiciary, its spirit to safeguard the federal system has become rather apparent. Now we come to Germany. As early as 1946, 
Germany saw established regional territories called Länder with their own governing machinery, parliamentary government in favor of democracy and headed by their own prime ministers. These prime ministers became instrumental in laying down the basic law or Grundgesetz of the unified Germany. The prime ministers were to set up a federal government in the interest of the rights of the constituent states and also to provide for a central government that would ensure rights and freedoms of individuals. The proposed federation of states would be empowered to oversee the application of federal law, govern the fiscal sharing structure, among other matters. The basic law, however, underwent several amendments during the unification of Germany but contained provisions to deal with the above. It identified Germany as a democratic and social federal state. Germany describes itself as a Bundesstaat of federal state but has its own peculiarities, like conferring most of the legislative power on the national government, while the constituent states have the power and responsibility to administer state and federal laws. The Bundesrat, which represents the lender, was created as a means to give the state adequate representation in domestic policy making. To generalize, the lender possessed the authority to administer most laws unless specifically excluded by the basic law. Fiscal matters were to be controlled by the union and the lender, independent of each other, where the role of the Bundesrat becomes that much more vital. Finally, we come to India. Seldom is India considered to be completely federal. Instead, it is thought to be federal in form, but mostly unitary in substance. It is a union of states where the state governments derive their powers from the central government. India's federal system found its origins in the Government of India Act 1935, which provided for British India and the then princely states to form a federal union. Many reasons contributed to in the establishment of a federal government in India. Its vast size, religious and linguistic diversity and other such reasons. These reasons also become important in other debates such as minority rights for certain religions or demarcation of states based on linguistic lines. These reasons become important in other debates as well, like minority rights for certain religions and demarcation of state boundaries along linguistic lines. India is also referred to as quasi-federal. On the legislative front, subjects on which the government may make laws are divided as per three lists the Union List for the Union Parliament, the State List for the State Legislative Assemblies, and the Concurrent List, which gives residual powers to the Union, except in the case of Jammu and Kashmir, where the residual powers vest in the State Legislative Assembly. In spite of this clear division, the State Legislative Assemblies may enact laws only when they are not contradictory to a law made by the Centre. The same predominance is true in the case of the Union Executive over the state governments and of the Supreme Court of India over subordinate courts. However, post-liberalization, India's federal structure can be described as cooperative come competitive owing itself to regional political parties whose agenda include consolidating interests based on economic, minority, religious and caste rights. As per the Indian Constitution, the Union is required to protect every state against external aggression as well as from internal disturbance. It is interesting to note that Article 356 of the Constitution virtually negates India's federal character. It gives the Union Executive, the President of India, the power to bring under its control a particular state if it is satisfied that the state is unable to comply with the provisions of the Constitution. The position before 1977 was rather rigid where this power of the president was outside the purview of judicial review. In S.R. Burmai v. Union of India, the Supreme Court clarified that such a declaration of president's rule was not absolute and was subject to judicial review just as any other action of the executive. India's disposition to a strong centre is time-tested and ties in closely with the judicial history surrounding the basic structure doctrine. Even though the constitution contains provisions like Article 3 that may be used to build a case against its federal structure, 
the Indian constitution is basically a federal constitution with certain exceptions. The federal character of the Indian constitution is held to be one of its basic features. In 1967, the Supreme Court of India in I.C. Golaknath versus State of Punjab prohibited the legislature from making any such amendment to the constitution that would take away or abridge the fundamental rights contained in part three of the constitution. If made, such an amendment would be null and void. Six years later, in Keshavnan Bharti versus State of Kerala, the Supreme Court overruled Golaknath and held that the parliament was indeed competent to amend any part of the constitution so long as it kept in mind that the basic structure of the constitution could not be abrogated even by constitutional amendment. Two years later, in a bid to restrict the judicial review of constitutional amendments following from Keshav Nand Bharti, the parliament enacted the 42nd amendment of the constitution, which, to sum briefly, sought to turn the parliament's limited powers to unlimited powers. Among other things, the amendment sought to prevent all constitutional amendments from being examined by the judiciary, thus giving itself unfettered power to amend the constitution. The Supreme Court of India, through its verdict in Minerva Mills v. Union of India, once again upheld the doctrine of basic structure, thus ensuring that the Union Parliament would never be able to compromise the federal structure of the constitution. Even so, federalism seems to be a part of the basic structure largely in thought and not in action. Over the years, India's federal structure has changed greatly, for example, with new states being created. Federalism, as a basic structure doctrine, exists perhaps for a situation where an unconstitutional act by the centre seeks to alter India's federal character altogether. In conclusion, it is important to note that federal structures, whether conceptualized as a means to an end or an end in itself, are often closely tied with the constitution, though that may not always be the case. It is quite evident that the nature of a federative system is fundamentally dynamic and very rarely rigid. There is not one, but several different types of federal structures that can be described as the ideal model, depending on the particularities and needs of a nation. In the Indian context, a quasi-federal approach was considered to be most appropriate in the fallout of India's independence movement. A strong centre made it administratively convenient and efficient to govern such a vast territory. At the same time, powers and rights of the state governments were also safeguarded in the constitution and by judicial action, with overriding powers being allowed only in select situations. Although there exist different theories and several practical forms of federalism, not a single one has been able to capture every facet of a federal structure and is merely a combination of only a few of them. Thank you.